Please. Okay, welcome everyone. It's Steve Kenzie from the UN Global Compact Network UK. Um, I'm glad you're able to join us for this, the final uh, installment in our SDG Compass webinar series. And today we're going to be looking at the fifth step in the SDG Compass, reporting and communicating. I am delighted to be joined by Sandy McDonald from Standard Life Aberdeen and Sarah Norris from Aberdeen Standard Investments, and we'll be hearing from them uh, in just a little while. Here's our plan for this webinar. Um, I'm going to very briefly introduce you to the UN Global Compact, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and, um, and the SDG Compass, and then we're going to have a a closer look at the fifth step in the compass, reporting and communicating. And then to end, we're going to hear from Standard Life Aberdeen and their experience um, with engaging with the SDGs. Um, so for those of you that have participated in the first four episodes in the series, um, this first bit will be a little bit repetitive, but I'm going to go through it just as quickly as I can. Um, for those of you that this is the first of these webinars that you've joined, do please get in touch if you have questions about any of these issues that you feel I haven't covered adequately. Um, if you do have questions, do feel free to use the, the chat function um, and I'll keep an eye on that and uh, do my very best to answer them. And similarly, as, as Sandy and Sarah are going through their presentation, please do um, type any questions you might have into the chat box and we'll deal with them as best we can. Okay, so to start, the UN Global Compact. We are mobilizing a global movement of sustainable companies and stakeholders to create the world we want. We've got globally over 10,000 businesses have already signed up across 160 countries and there are uh, 70 local networks, not unlike ours here in the UK, operating uh, around the world, providing more localized support uh, to companies that have made the commitment to the Global Compact. Here in the UK, there are over 530 organizations that have signed up to this initiative. What are you signing up to? Well, the essence of the Global Compact are 10 universal principles derived from UN treaties in the areas of human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. And because of that connection to UN treaties, these are truly universal principles. So for a multinational company operating around the world and potentially challenging markets, we think it's a real uh, strength if your supplier code of conduct, if your sustainability policies are built upon these 10 principles, it gives you a really robust foundation um, that you can point to if you're getting pushback from uh, from any of your suppliers or local operators. In order to join the commitment, it's a CEO commitment. The CEO needs to send a letter to the UN Secretary General. And in that letter, we need to see a commitment to operationalizing the 10 principles throughout the company. We need to see a commitment to report annually on the progress that your company is making towards uh, operationalizing the principles. And thirdly, a commitment to support the wider UN development agenda. And for the time being, the wider UN development agenda looks like this, the Sustainable Development Goals. What are the SDGs? Well, they, they are superficially 17 goals with 169 more detailed targets beneath them and another 232 indicators to measure progress and they were agreed in 2015. Every member state in the UN um, signed up to this. So it, it's a truly a global initiative. And in essence, it's there to create the future we want. It's the result of a massive consultation undertaken by the UN, um, speaking to stakeholders in every sector um, all around the world. And this is effectively what the people have said they want for the future. Um, and it covers you know, people and planet and prosperity and peace. And it all comes together with partnership. Um, I won't go into too much details about the goals here, but I do urge you to be familiar with this agenda. This is step number one 
in the SDG compass and um, really important that you be familiar with uh, the targets beneath these, these high level goals. Now this slide, if you are wondering um, why, why you should care about the SDGs, the purpose of this slide is to give you some reason for that. Starting on the left, you can see two prime ministers um, wearing SDG pin, lapel pins. Even though we've not heard a lot from the UK government about this agenda, I, I want you to rest assured that the government is aware of it and they are taking steps to implement this agenda. It's already influencing government policy and regardless of how things go today, we can expect um, the SDGs to continue to influence government policy. The cover uh, that's, that's next over as we move to the right is, is a picture of um, the voluntary national review that the UK government presented at the UN last July, summing up our, our current progress in the UK towards achieving this agenda. It certainly makes for uh, interesting reading, shall we say. Um, there's certainly lots more work to be done, but the, really, the reason I'm pointing this out to you is just to make you better understand or realize that, as I said earlier, it's already affecting policy and we should expect it to do so in the future. It would be imprudent, I think, for a company to not be familiar with this agenda. Sort of reinforcing that idea of inevitability is that headline from Mark Carney. He's referring to uh, the TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures, um, which is at the moment voluntary, but um, he's basically saying if companies don't step up and start acting in a strong way on climate and in their climate related disclosures, the government will step in and impose uh, regulation in this area. So I want to I suppose emphasize then, while engaging with the SDGs is ostensibly voluntary, um, in reality, this is something that really every company needs to think about. An example of that would be this headline about Uber. This actual headline is a couple of years old, but obviously they're back in the news again. Um, and I think it's, it's a great headline um, for those of us that work in sustainability. Um, they lost their license due to a lack of corporate responsibility. Um, there's a tendency, I think, to almost diminish some of these issues relating to sustainability, relating to corporate sustainability, corporate responsibility, to put them in a box labeled non-financial and, and somehow treat them as less critical. I think this Uber headline really shouts out that um, that there's a real blurring of the lines and that non-financial can become financial very quickly if they're, they're not uh, being monitored properly. The picture in the middle of the big crowd, that's uh, Extinction Rebellion taking to the streets of London to protest climate change, but I could just as easily have put a picture up there from Beirut or from Santiago, Chile or from Hong Kong. The people are taking to the streets demanding action on this agenda. In every one of those big, uh, protest movements, we can draw a straight line uh, from what the people are asking for to the SDGs. This is an agenda that, that people are crying out for. And these, these people are highly motivated and, um, but we're gonna see more and more customers, investors, regulators, uh, um, communities in general, expecting uh, their governments and the companies operating in their communities uh, to be respecting this agenda. And the, the last picture is um, I think a, a really amazing new phenomenon, and this is the employees of Amazon walking out on strike because they didn't feel their company was doing enough uh, to address uh, climate change. So the big takeaway from this slide um, that I want you to really be thinking about is just engaging around this issue is not uh, really shouldn't be viewed as optional. These are absolutely critical business issues central to the success of any, of any company going forward. And, and so I really urge you to be familiar with it and to engage. So one of the most um, effective tools for business engagement around the SDGs 
is the SDG compass. It's a simple five step um, model, starting with understanding the SDGs, defining priorities, looking at your value chain, looking at your impacts at the level of the targets, both positive and negative, and, and identifying where your impacts are greatest, and then setting goals um, to make real ambit ambitious changes to maximizing your positive impacts and minimizing your negative ones, then taking steps to integrate the goals into your, um, into your company. And that's your know, senior leadership buy-in and aligning incentives throughout the company to sustainable goals. And then finally, effectively reporting and communicating on this agenda, both um, really to, to bring both internal and external stakeholders with you along on the journey. There's links here, and we'll share these slides after, links to the recordings for all of the previous sessions, and we'll have a recording from today um, that we'll be able to share with you when it's all, when it's all done, should you wish, and, and we'll share this um, with you. So for today, we're looking at the fifth step on reporting, and, and obviously, this is a critical step. Um, that there's so much around sustainability reporting that's, that's really critical. Certainly a commitment to external reporting um, is a key driver internally um, to help ensure that you have something uh, significant to talk about with your external stakeholders. And so that's certainly something that sustainability professionals can leverage um, in internal discussions when you're looking for um, greater ambition from your, your colleagues within the company. But it also serves a really important role of inspiring um, other companies, when they see the great things that your company is doing, you're putting pressure on the whole market um, to step up their ambition and, and to match yours. Um, another key consideration in reporting, of course, is to use internationally recognized standards. If you're reporting in isolation, it's less effective. Um, what investors are really calling out for, and I, I think we'll hear from Sandy and Sarah on this point, um, is information that they can use for investment purposes. And they need to be able to compare your company's performance against other companies in your sector. So by using recognized standards of reporting, um, it allows that to happen. And that's really critically important. This is a a piece that's been pulled out of the SDG Compass. And you can obviously see the whole SDG Compass at, at www.sdgcompass.org. This is just a feature to help you, um, guide you around uh, materiality and reporting. And I think it's a, something that you'll see in a lot of reports um, if, you, if you look at sustainability reports. And of course, it's really important that you focus on what's material and not just fill up page after page of um, uh, of a report just for the sake of, of filling pages. So going through a reporting exercise, uh, a materiality exercise such as this is a really worthwhile undertaking to ensure that the material, material you're putting into the public domain is, is really valuable. Okay, I promised to be fast, so I, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop there. And, and now I'm really pleased to be able to introduce um, Sandy McDonald uh, from Standard Life Aberdeen. And Sandy, you should be unmuted now. And so I I'm am, ready. I hope you can hear me, Steve. Um, so, uh, thank you very much. Hope that people can can hear us okay. Um, so Standard Life Aberdeen is a global investment company. Um, we have uh, within that a few different brands. So people who are Sandy, if anyone else is having problems, please maybe say something through the chat. Do you want to... oh. 
Okay. That looks like uh, now I'm unmuted, but I think everybody might be. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll carry on. Um, so um, within Standard Life Aberdeen group of companies, um, Aberdeen Standard Investments is the largest part of that business, and that's the actual asset management business within the group. But we also have Standard Life, which is, is a UK uh, platforms and advice business, and um, we have joint ventures and investments um, in the UK, in India, in China, um, and essentially we're a global business, and our primary purpose is to help our customers and clients to invest for a, a, a better future. Um, and that is increasingly holistic. So the primary responsibility is clearly they will have financial goals when they, when they give us their money. But the, you know, the purpose being around a better future links in well with the sustainable development goals because it's also about um, the world that, that we live in um, and the role that um, big global investment companies like ours play in that. So. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit. My job is in the PLC uh, part of the business, Standard Life Aberdeen PLC. So I'm going to talk a bit about our own process um, as a corporate on reporting. Um, and then Sarah is going to talk about how, um, as an investment company, we use reports and measure impact and um, essentially how other people's reporting enables us to allocate capital against the goals and to help clients meet their goals. Meet their um, end uh, approach. So, Steve, if you want to move on to the next slide, or whoever's doing that for us. Um, so, I know you've already covered steps two to four in previous webinars in the SDG Compass, but this is essentially the the process that we work through. Um, I wanted to just call out a couple of particular elements on here. The first is around that stakeholder mapping that's part of your materiality review and understanding what's important to your stakeholders. Um, the second, uh, or the one above it in the inverted pyramid, is around your long-term economic, environmental, and social development. Um, and there's this piece that's around long-term value. And I think, you know, as investment companies where we do have that financial role, it's it's not purely a case of, um, well, I guess if it's if it's purely about your uh, social contribution, you're you're a charity, and there isn't necessarily a financial return. Whereas for us. We've got, to, we've got to balance the two. Um, and I think the purpose of the business is the important thing here. It, it touches everything we do. It's the role we play in society, how we take care of our customers, our people. Um, and it's about how you take action now to keep it fit for the future. But any, any business could do a huge number of things that are beneficial and useful against the goals. But it's what are you kind of uniquely well-placed to do and what's relevant? And that's how we go about defining our sustainability priorities and the actions that we're taking. Um, and I think the final thing I would say, Steve's already covered this in, in his slide with the various visuals, but the I've been in this job for about six years and during that time the, the rising interest people are taking and stakeholder expectations has been has been really, really significant. And some things that were very difficult to get interest in and drive forward now we have a different challenge in that everybody's driving us to do things and it's it's sometimes waiting through a sea of kind of different things to 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 get a clear future direction that is that is the challenge um so if you want to move on to the next um the next one so i i'm not going to talk through every point here they mostly speak for themselves but it's really just to to labor the point slightly about how materiality is vital and what we see quite often is is people reporting things that are easy to measure but they're not really around the core business um but the core business stuff i would acknowledge and you'll see this from when i'm talking about our own experience it's it's often the hardest thing to do and to get the um the the, the measurement and the data around um the reason we like the sustainable development goals is it is it, it is a useful common framework and a global language for comparability it's is the closest thing we have uh, um, ultimately for a global consensus on a, a future vision for what's important across all your different stakeholder groups and the kind of future world we want to live in so that's a very useful proxy i would say that um awareness is still not as high as we'd like 
So I think we've, there's, there's a shared aim we probably all have if we're interested in this, in continuing to raise knowledge and awareness um, as well. Um, and I think on the third point, uh, Sarah, I think, will probably talk a little bit more about this. There's a journey there that most companies we speak to are on where the first part, environmental, social, and economic and stakeholder things, that, you know, it's, a, it's understanding what, what risks your company faces. Um, first step is to, is, is to just have that awareness and understand how you impact on the, the world and the planet. The second part is then being able to kind of invest in managing and measuring those impacts. Um, and there's a, there's a journey that we recognize that most people are on, but we would give people generally credit for, you know, at least starting and being somewhere on that curve and demonstrating their intent to move along it. Um, okay. So, um, next, um, slide please. So this is, is, is our, essentially where we know we have an impact on the world. So um, within our sustainability strategy, we're thinking about three particular boxes. So the first one, it starts with us. Um, that's our own operations, our own people, um, how we look after those employees, our governance, our conduct, um, the environmental impact of our buildings. Also supply chain, but for us as a service business, supply chain is not as material. Um, you know, if we were the kind of company that was using lots of natural resources, chemicals and factories and things like that, then it, then it would obviously be much more material for us. We're a service business, so um, less so. But if I move on to the next pillar, investing with purpose, that's the biggest impact we have on the world, and it's indirect. So um, when we are investing across different asset classes, we are um, obviously those companies that, that are using chemicals or have factories, that's where we're having a real, a real impact on the world. So... Um, Sarah will talk more about this, but it ranges from us integrating environmental, social and governance considerations in all our mainstream investment through to specific solutions that are all about the impact. And then the final pillar there um, is about, I guess, how we then work in partnership with others um, and the impact that we have in terms of working with as an industry, with um, client bodies, trade bodies, with charities and NGOs, with a range of other stakeholders, and may, maybe you know you could also present it as something that runs through um, the other pillars or wraps around them as well, because it's it's not a kind of discrete pillar. But there are many problems that I think will only be solved by people working together, which I guess is uh, also a nod to um, goal 17 around partnerships for the goals. But the best ways in which we work, um, I think uh, I'm going to try and demonstrate, is where we're thinking right the way through every area that we have an impact. So, um, you know, it will run through our own operations, the way that we invest, and also um, how we un uh, collaborate to unlock solutions. So, um, the next slide, just um, briefly shows this is, this is an actual page from our uh, annual sustainability report, which you, you can find the full report on our website. But you'll see that we've, we've described on the left-hand side how the goals relate to us as an investment company. One of the challenges we face is that because we're invested, we, we have around about, it's a while since we last reported, but around about 550 billion pounds worth of assets under management around the world. And so in, in one way or another, we're, we're across every single one of the 17 goals. So isolating specific actions, I know that there'll be other companies and other sectors that will zone in on two or three quite clearly. Um, we've made a decision as well as the impact across all of the goals to have a particular focus on um, goal number eight around decent work and economic growth. And um, we also focus quite heavily on goal 17, which is around partnerships for the goals. Um, but the table on the right hand side will tell you um, it hones in on a few specific SDG targets that can be found elsewhere in our report to save me going through 30 or 40 pages of report. There's one page spread for you. Okay. Um, if uh, oh, The other thing I was briefly going to mention is uh, asset classes. So we, we invest in companies directly, which I've already referenced, but also in real estate, private markets, infrastructure, fixed income. So things like um, property and real estate, of course, you know, it's, it, it's actually relatively easy in many of those to, to measure your environmental impact um, because of existing regulation, but also in terms of the nature of that asset. That's not the same in some other places. 
Okay, if you want to go to the next um, slide. So this is an overview again, um, without going into loads of detail of some of how we're, we're interacting on um, UN Sustainable um, Development Goal 8. Um, so we have, um, we have a focus as an employer, uh, which actually there's no visuals of this, but we, um, we measure our inclusive employment, we have a living wage um, plan, we measure progression of our employees, and all of that's in our people data. And then we also have um, in our investing aspect, um, you'll see there's a column there around impact investing. Um, we have a particular UK uh, equity impact employment opportunities fund that is in partnership with an organization called Big Issue Invest, um, which grew out of the Big Issue magazine, which I think many people will, will know. Um, but that fund deliberately invests in companies that are having a measurable positive impact through um, good quality employment um, and the benefits that that brings. And we believe that that social investment can also drive a financial return. We are also working with Big Issue Invest on a project called Power Up Scotland, which is early stage lending to social enterprises. Um, and again, there's a focus there on um, good quality work, um, inclusive employment, and um, there's, there's examples there within the report. I wanted to mention, you'll see a, there's a link there across the bottom left-hand side of the page there. Uh, there's a website called supportthegoals.org. Um, it's, it's an interesting website if you have a bit of time to kill sometime and you're wanting to look at specific examples of companies who have written up the impact that they're having against particular goals. Um, and we have a write-up there of the, the Power Up Scotland initiative and how it is has a, having a measurable impact against um, a specific target within goal number um, eight. Um, there are loads of other examples from all manner of different companies across sectors. So. Um, if you know, uh, in the time that we've got allowed, I'm just going to point you to the link and leave it at that. Um, so um, I think that's probably enough on that slide. And then the final thing I was going to share before handing over to to Sarah is is really just the the data and disclosure more generally. Uh, I've already talked about how you know, for us to be able to measure all the impact we have as an investment company, we are completely reliant on the assets that we invest in reporting all of their impact, um, which means we don't have the same level of data and disclosure on there. And in fact, the more people that start doing that, the easier it is for, for us to understand what we're doing. But there is this huge trend towards um, disclosure more generally and that expectation that you will um, be transparent, and I think you know that's a useful thing against trends such as the loss of trust in business, but also because part of the way that the investment community and the industry is is seeking to have an impact is it's very difficult to deliver change on your own. But if you look at initiatives uh, that are collaborative, like the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, or TCFD, uh, as it's known by many, or the Workforce Disclosure Initiative. What we're trying to do there is encourage, just make much clearer um, publishing of data that means that we can look across companies. And this is not necessarily about trying to catch people out. It's about really knowing and understanding a company. And sometimes companies can have low scores on something, but the opportunity for us as an investor is in engaging with them to understand how they're addressing something, and it will lead to greater performance. Um, in both non-financial and financial measures. So um, the, a lot of the time what we're really looking for um, right now is people knowing this stuff and demonstrating they've thought about it as much as we are expecting it to be uh, perfect. We recognize it's, it's difficult. So I think I was, going to, um, I was going to finish there and I'm going to hand over to Sarah who's going to talk through uh, in more detail the investment side. Good afternoon. Um, so I will be quick. If we switch on to the next slide, um, I wanted to start by talking about how we as investors will use different types of data. So we really don't make it easy for clients. We've got different types of outcomes that use sustainability-related data differently. If you think about kind of the ABCs, so avoid, benefit, and contribute, in some cases, we're just looking at business practices and we're seeing what types of businesses are companies exposed to. Are they exposed to an extractive industry, to tobacco, to alcohol? And, and that type of reporting is fairly easy and fairly standard to come by. We generally have a good sense of, of where a company is making revenues. 
Um, but then we're also looking at, at the, how a company is running itself and looking at how its operations are having an impact. This is, is largely a focus with our, our sustainable and responsible suite of products where we're looking to see companies improving their operations, so acknowledging that your operations as well as your products and services can have an impact and how can a company improve the factories that it's running, improve its um, climate change policies, its human rights policies and its labor relations. And then finally, you, you have impact products where there we aim to deliver a double bottom line. It's not just outperformance of the stocks that we're investing in, but it's also companies that are delivering positive social and environmental outcomes through their products and services. And this is really where we're focusing on trying to collect better data. It's not a question of more data, it's a question of better data. And when we talk about impact, you'll, you'll see on the next slide, we use the sustainable development goals to really define what we mean by positive social and environmental impact. Here we have all 17 goals aligned to, to eight pillars of impact. These are very much investable themes that we think about because as, as we've talked about earlier, the 17 goals are a business plan for the world and they're for countries to achieve. They're not for companies. Companies very much focus on the UN Global Compact and business practices, but it's an acknowledgement that for the world to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, you need investment across a range of different asset owners, regulators, consumers, governments, and you need buy-in from society as a whole. So we think that they make, a, as Sandy was talking about, a very useful tool and framework and common language. So when we're talking about data disclosure from companies, companies are being asked the same types of questions, and you're not having this overwhelming request for all types of variability data sources, it's all one unique data source. Um, on the next slide, you, you'll see our framework for impact investing leverages very heavily off the 17 sustainable development goals in terms of the types of data that, that we're requesting. So we look at those key performance indicators that, that we've mentioned earlier in the webinar, drawing on the 17 sustainable development goals to identify how companies can report on the most relevant indicators for their business processes. And it's not just the how a company is running itself, but how a company's products and services are contributing to these specific goals and, and really supporting the three challenges that, that we think that the UN has identified with its development agenda around climate change, reducing inequalities, and addressing unsustainable consumption and production. And we acknowledge that, that companies will not necessarily have all the data to hand at the moment. Our next slide really, really focuses on, on how we're looking at companies and how we're assessing a company's journey. And it, it does align with the, the SDG Compass and that we're looking for a company to have a stated strategy and material investment to deliver a, a, a product that has a social or an environmental objective, delivering a positive change case. And, and through that investment and that strategy, we see that come into the business processes and into the actual revenues that the company is generating, looking for companies that have a material exposure to these products and services. We want companies that are really shifting their business models, not just going on a tangent or a pet project, um, but really trying to deliver revolutionary positive change, not reactionary change. And then finally, we look to see how a company is reporting and measuring. And, and, and as that, Sandy said, it's incredibly difficult to collect the data at the moment because there is no standardization and because you have so many different data sources and so many different demands. But we expect that if a company is intentionally investing to deliver a material business product, it should eventually be able to measure it, its impact. And, and on the next slide, you can see the types of data that, that we're requesting from companies. When we think about financial inclusion, we're looking at just under 2 billion people in the world that don't have access to financial services, and these are quality financial services. So access to financial literacy programs, understanding of how loans work, how basic account services work. And what we're doing is we're looking for companies who are actively investing to deliver these types of products and services so that we can then understand who their customers are and where, where they're located and how they're being 
benefiting from the types of products that they are receiving. So you can see those underserved customers are of the are customers within that, that two billion number that previously didn't have access to a quality financial service, whether that's insurance or, or banking. Um, and we try and relate that to, to standard numbers, so whether that's the population of South America or Twitter users, to, to tell a relatable story. But the message I would draw out is that this is incredibly difficult at the moment because you don't have access to all of this data. At the moment, we are relying on companies to disclose this in their annual reports, in conversations that we have with them, as well as through an annual survey. But what we aim to be able to do um, when we think about all of the, the types of impact that we are, are delivering is on the next slide, is really being able to show where these customers reside, where carbon is being offset or mitigated, um, where, where basic uh, healthcare services are, are being distributed so that when you think about the impact and it relates back to how a company can really drive impact according to the sustainable development goals, you, you're be better able to relate it back to a country level prog progress. So a company is really able to have material impact on social and environmental issues within the company that it's op country that it's operating in. Um, so I'll stop there because I think we, we had wanted a couple minutes for questions. Thanks very much, Sarah and Sandy. Um, and so yes, to to all our participants, do feel free to type a question into the chat, um, and we will. We'll be happy to uh, to answer that for you. Um, while we're waiting, I have a couple of questions, though, if I may. Um, maybe starting, uh, Sandy. We talked about um, the workforce disclosure initiative and TCFD and um, the value in these sort of global frameworks that, that bring some consistency to reporting. Do you, um, do you incentivize or how would you describe how you encourage uh, companies to participate in these, in, in these initiatives? Is there, is there an actual sort of proactive effort from your side to, to get companies involved? Yeah, I, th I think a, a few different areas to that. The first is is the nature of the collaboration itself. So um, for anybody who was watching um, COP this week, there was uh, various commitments where uh, pretty much the entire industry came together and said what they were looking for in terms of climate action. Um, so what that means is that there's a much broader range of expectation because if you think about it at its simplest level, if you've got one company that isn't, one investment company that isn't happy with something and they drop it and another one just comes in, all the company sees is a change in share ownership. Um, but if every investment company is likely to ask you similar questions, then there's a benefit to you if you want to attract investment in being able to, to answer those kinds of things. And of course, you know, in some domain, within the UK, environmental emissions data is, is a regulatory requirement. but what TCFD is asking for is not just can you disclose some data, it's asking you about the governance and is it being taken seriously at executive at board level, it's asking you about what your strategy is to manage, manage your impact and then to report against them. So I think there's kind of, um, th there's a range of different aspects there that, that taken together in, you know, encourage that kind of um, um, increasing thing. Now we're, we're just implementing TCFD ourselves this year and it's, um, it's quite a lot of work, um, I'll be honest, but it, it, again, it's a common framework. It means that if you're a company, you do it once and you're going to achieve something that works for a range of different investors and is, is meeting the same goals. Right, so unlike say the, the effort you put into the DJSI questionnaire this the, the TCFD efforts are going to, in theory, uh, go further. Yeah, I mean we we do DGSI as as well, but DGSI, you know, it's 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 a uh, it's what it's each sector, so it's tailored for each sector. There's a lot of different. It's a it's a big piece of work. I think TCFD is is something that's common across sectors. Um, they that I think these. A lot of these tools are useful and um, 
you know, depending on the bandwidth of your team to take part in every single one of them, um, each of them can add value in a particular way. We've had a question from Greg. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it, Sandy, but uh, do you link sustainability measures to financial performance measures in your marketing, or do you, um, I guess, expressly not do this? I'm not sure. Um... So I guess from when we're speaking to companies and we're talking about the types of products that we offer um, within the investment side of things, we do. We we actively link our, our ESG analysis with with how a company is performing because I think oftentimes investors sometimes think will think that ESG is, is an add-on or is an overlay and it's not integrated but if you have a company that does not have appropriate sustainability policies around human rights around labor around governance you'll often see a an issue when it comes to valuation of that company and, and that can, as Sandy said, have material negative financial consequences. So when we're talking about any one of our, our funds, whether they have a sustainability mandate or not, ESG is explicitly important for how we think about that company's performance. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, my, my read of the question is essentially, can we measure the financial benefit that we get as a company? because we are looking at these areas of sustainability. And I guess I would say that is, that is the goal. I think you'll, you'll get credit for these, these things if you can directly tie them back to financial performance. The thing that's quite difficult for us is, is, is how you isolate it. So when we look at, for example, ESG engagement on the investment side, and if we're asking a company to do something and they do it and then their financial performance improves as a result, we may not be the only investment company asking them. Their consumers may also be asking them. The government may also be asking them. So it's quite difficult to isolate the difference you've made. Similarly, if I look at the financial advice part of our business, you know, in, in an ideal world, you would measure the social benefit and the benefit to the customer you derive through you giving them advice. But you're not in control of all the factors mm -hmm. that ultimately you know, deliver the outcome that, that we have. But I, I'd, I'd say the, the more the journey we've been on in recent times is you can measure, for example, your your charity programs exactly and say, oh, we're working with this person and we helped a thousand people into employment working with this charity, but that's not really about our core business. That's a reputational benefit and maybe a community benefit. Um, where we're trying to get to is, is, is ever closer to aligning the performance of our business as a result of being aware of all those environmental and mm -hmm. social aspects. Sorry, it's a bit conceptual, but hopefully mm -hmm. it Useful. Morgan Stanley recently published a, a paper linking sustainability factors with outperformance and it, it shows that if you have sustainability factors considered within your investments and you're, you're investing in companies that are good sustainable performers both operationally and from the products that they deliver, you limit your downside risk. Yeah. So there are tangible measures and we're getting there as a community. But it's it kind is of a proxy time. for being a well-managed business because yeah. you're aware of your environmental and social impacts. So, so it'll take time. We're, we're on the way to, to being able to link. Fabulous. Thank you. And I think on that note, um, we're going to draw to a close because I think um, even more than usual today, uh, I don't want to cut into anyone's time uh, that might prevent you from getting to the polling station. So I'm going to uh, thank very much uh, Sandy and, and Sarah for your contributions today. Thank you all for joining um, this, uh, this webinar. Um, I hope you have a great afternoon and a happy Christmas. And um, we look forward to uh, working with you in the future on all of this. And once again, uh, do all get out there and vote today uh, obviously very important all right thanks very much and, and good day to you thanks Dave. thank you